because you collect in these stories. What's so great about it? And I think it's really, you know, that tells you how the whole community really didn't think they had anything to talk about, which I don't agree with. Yes. And I think now a lot of people have yes. realized it's just coming out as, because it wasn't just those simple mm -hmm. things. It's also that the language was lost. The culture was lost. The history was lost. And mm -hmm. those are so huge. I mean, they just kind of, uh, unsettled, they're disorienting. The, the whole identity is in a flux. Namaste and welcome back to Indian History and Archaeology. I'm your host, Dr. Lajwanti Shahani, with yet another episode of Archaeo Talks. And today's guest. Saz Agarwal is doing something completely different, yet actually close enough to recording history, recording oral history of the Sindhi community, which moved into this part of India after the partition and the independence of our country. She has been collecting personal stories narrated by um, Sindhis. She has authored and curated these stories into books, some of these titles being Sindh, Stories from a Vanished Homeland, Sindhi Tapestry, Reflections on the Sindhi Identity and Anthology, The Amels of Sindh, A Narrative History of a Remarkable Community. Today we're having a conversation about her latest book release. Being a Sindhi, this topic is absolutely close to my heart personally. And as an undergraduate student of history and of course uh, later archaeology, this region has been extremely close to my heart. I'm looking forward to this conversation with Saz and I hope you enjoy this too. First of all, congratulations to you. Lak lak vadayu. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Your new book, Losing Home, Finding Home. Tell us more about it. Well, it's, um, it's a book which puts together a lot of the research I've done over the last 10 years. Uh, it tells, it's a collection of personal narratives. And it's, uh, I, I think it kind of covers the spectrum of the story of what the Sindhis went through during partition. Uh, partly, it goes back a little to tell the history that gave the people who were displaced the kind of advantages they had, the kind of skills they had, which helped them to settle. But it's, it also, uh, to in, a, in a sense, in that sense, it's a history book. Uh, but it also has a lot of images and some of them are illustrations which have been done by an artist and the brief I gave him was that mm -hmm. I want them historically authentic because these are scenes for which we don't have photographs and um, we did use some photos as references I gave him a lot of descriptions some of which I'd collected over the years through interviews and he's done a really good job there's a lot of detail but I've also used some uh, vintage photographs. So uh, in that sense, I, I would also call it an art book. But then, you know, more than anything else, it's an inspiring book which tells you what happens when bad things happen to you in life, which happen to everyone at some point or the other. And um, the spirit with which you cope and, you know, how you bring your sense of creative enterprise to the fore and um, get cracking and you know overcome so that's actually what my book is about how would you explain the title to a non-sindhi i mean i'm sure we have a lot of non-sindhi audiences also. oh yeah uh, um, yeah especially and in india not many people really have a good understanding of the impact of the partition on sindhis you know the sindhi community you're very right about that because Sindhis are seen as generally prosperous, well integrated. You know, they're seen as people who are solid. They're not seen as people who uh, are unfortunate by any means, you know. And I think that's a credit to them that they dealt with their misfortunes in a very seamless kind of way. And that uh, 
people just haven't seen the huge loss that they uh, that they made. So here, what we have is that they lost their homes, and then they didn't just find their homes. Of course, there was this huge process of loss and uh, reconciliation, and then um, you know, putting, uh, gathering together strength, using uh, ideas and hard work, and being single-minded in their goals. So you know, when I say losing home, finding home. It wasn't just that, uh, you know, the home was lost and then they found another home. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 there's, a, there's a long story in between also. So that's yeah. uh, that's how I would talk about the story. And I, I like the fact that you, uh, you know, brought this up that for non-Sindhis, uh, they don't really understand what happened. Yeah. Yes. The um, huge it loss. It was a rebuilding. It was a rebuilding of lives, really. As I, heroic, as, heroic rebuilding is the way I like to think about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. So what made you develop uh, an interest in the human stories behind the partition? Because that's what your book seems to be about, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, I've always been interested in human stories. That's my, um, that's, you know, so, something that I do. Uh, but when it comes to partition, it's really quite unexpected. It wasn't something that was in my path. And, you know, uh, I knew it was there. It was completely by chance. The thing is that I'm a writer. And I've always been a writer ever since a very young age. And um, along the way, I began to specialize in working with people to help them write their memoirs. So that's actually what I do. That's my profession. But uh, at some point, I said to my mother that, you know, I do this with everybody. Why don't you and I do this together? And uh, I, at that point, I was only thinking of something for the family. So I said to her, just tell me about what your life was like in sin then. Um, you know, what it was like before there was anything, to, uh, you know, mm. nobody knew partition was going to happen. And then what happened during partition and then what happened after that. And the thing is, nobody knew in the family because they never spoke about it. My grandparents and the elder siblings who right. had actually been through it. Nobody. I mean, it was just not a matter of consequence. It was not something which was dwelt on. It was not something which was spoken about. And none of us had any inkling of, uh, you know, anything that they'd gone through. So when I, when I said to her to tell me, it was more like, you know, this is something for the family. We'll collect photos from her cousins who have photos and, you know, I'll make a little booklet. So she, she agreed and she began to very sportingly tell me. Uh, she would come in the morning and sit down in front of me and I would uh, type what she was saying. And I realized on the second day, because she, the, the kind of things that she was telling me, first of all, she had not spoken about it for 65 years. And the whole yeah. thing was there so vividly clear in her mind. The extent of detail absolutely astonished me. Secondly, there were so many interesting things that I absolutely had no idea about. She remembered, I mean, she was 13 years old when partition took place. So she wasn't a little kid. But she was also not, you know, a grown up. She was a child. But she remembered some of, my grandfather was a lawyer and she remembered some of his high profile cases. So that made me curious. I wanted to know more about those, um, you know, they were cases which were very much connected with Sindhi history. Uh, like for example, when uh, the chief minister of Sindh, uh, uh, Sumro, uh, a wonderful person, very secular, very popular. And I think he was from Shikarpur. Uh, he was shot down in broad daylight. And um, the, uh, another senior politician, Kuro, he was uh, uh, accused. Now there was a team of lawyers who got Kuro acquitted and uh, one of them, uh, my grandfather was part of that. So I just found this really interesting. And later on, I realized what a complicated case it was. 
because um, you know the whole course of uh, uh, Sindhi history and even Indian history may have been kind of influenced by uh, Sumbra being killed and uh, the secular aspect removed and it made it became just easier for Pakistan to be formed. But then there was also, you know, there were so many small things. For example, she remembered the date on which their ship arrived in Bombay, which I thought was absolutely okay. remarkable because, as I said, she was 13. So she told me how the ship, you know, it was two nights on the ship. And then uh, on the third day, they could see the shore of Bombay, but they weren't allowed to land. They were told that they, uh, um, you know, they, they haven't, the ship hasn't been given permission to dock. So it was really scary because they did not know what had happened. They did not know why. They didn't know whether they were going to be turned back. And they'd left everything. They'd, you know, um, given away their stuff. Where would they go? What if they were being sent off to some third place where they didn't know anybody? So it was all like, you know, a time of great anxiety. Two, two, one, uh, two nights they were like that. And then finally they arrived. And then she says it was the 14th of November. So that really, really uh, surprised me. And, you know, of course, the fact that she remembered all this, there was a lot in there. And also the fact that I thought it was extremely interesting. And then I realized that nobody's really written about this, you know. There's not much known. We know yes. so much about Punjab and Bengal. There are movies, there are books, there are exactly. TV series. I mean, the two most famous I can think of are mm -hmm. Tamas and Buniyad. And Tamas. oddly right. enough, they were both written by Sindhis, but they're both about Punjab. Govind Nelani and... Okay. Um, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, You're right. And uh, Sippy. So, you know, they, they were both Sindhis. Mm -hmm. I but think the story uh, was seen as inconsequential. To make a case for, uh, you know, the traumatic events, the uh, memories of traumatic events being kind of shut down by the community. Maybe because of the shock of it, you know, because they weren't expecting this to happen somehow for some reason. Maybe because it was comparatively more peaceful in sin. Yeah. yeah. But uh, would you agree that uh, we have something called inherited memories? I think in that's this particular a, case. I, I do about, agree uh, with that. I mean, people are talking about that more and more now. And uh, yes, I do feel mm -hmm. that uh, these things get passed down through the generations, generational trauma. Uh, 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 Sindhis mm -hmm. didn't speak about their, uh, you know, they, they didn't tell their story. And partly it's because they didn't feel they had a story to tell. And the, uh, the you know, the Punjab story, there was so much blood and every single family experienced right. horrific, barbaric violence, which uh, was not true in the case of Sin. There was violence, but it wasn't so widespread and so uh, rabid right. as uh, in Punjab and Bengal probably. But yeah, there was definitely was violence. As a matter of fact, I had uh, done a um, college project during my undergraduate on, on this topic itself. And it's been many, many years ago, of course. So I have to dig it out. And hopefully if I can find it in my storage, you know, bring out all that material. It would be also very, very interesting even reading at that. At that point, I remember, um, yes, uh, so I was interviewing family and uh, friends, basically, who found it very strange, you know, that somebody wants to know about this. I mean, they just kind of moved on. Yeah, I get that all the time. But we they didn't do. feel they had anything to talk about. Uh, I had this one incident mm -hmm. where, you know, as I told you, I work with people to help them write their memoirs. So I did this with this Dubey gentleman from UP, who was writing about his father, who was a freedom fighter and a social worker. And he was his, he himself had been to jail, but his father, uh, who, who, you know, he as a young boy, 
um, but his father had been in jail and a lot of work. And one of the stories he told me was about how when he was in college and he visited his family, they were in, living in Agra and the place was full of refugees. And one day he brought, his father brought this Sindhi gentleman with his wife and mother. Uh, they had escaped with nothing but the clothes on their backs from Sindh. And he brought them home and, you know, he gave them a little corner of their veranda and they uh, had a bath and they wore this, washed their clothes and wore the same clothes again because they didn't have anything else. And he said the next morning, this man went to the market and he bought a sack of grain from the wholesale market. And then he sat in the retail section and he sold the grain at a lower price than in the shops. And uh, so he found it easy to sell everything. And after after he'd sold everything, he sold the sack also, which uh, I think a lot of Sindhis did. Uh, you know, they'd always sell the sack or box the box. So you know, that that was something I've heard so many times. Interesting. Uh, and then he said, you know, that yeah. on the third day we didn't have to feed them anymore, and they became self sufficient. And in time, they had a factory in Kanpur. So now I think this is a fabulous story, but somebody who I know who is all, who is a Sindhi and, you know, about my age, and she said, why did he tell you that? I mean, he only told you that because you collect Sindhi stories. What's so great about it? And I think it's really, you know, that tells you how the whole community really didn't think they had anything to talk about, which I don't agree with. Yes. And I think now a lot of people have yes. realized it, it's just coming out as... Because it wasn't just those simple mm -hmm. things. It's also that the language was lost. The culture was lost. The history was lost. Yeah. And yeah. those are so huge. I mean, they just kind of uh, unsettled. They're disorienting. The, the whole identity is in a flux. No, as a matter of fact, there's an entire generation also lost, I would say. you know, It's just the younger people from that period who had moved to yeah. India, this side of India, uh, who may not have, you know, very kind of uh, aware memories, I would say. Yeah. You know, the older people, like my parents, who were uh, kind of in their mid-teens and late teens, even their older siblings, they were aware of what was happening. Yeah. At that, uh, at that point of time, but they never spoke. And now they've moved on, you know, so they've it's gone. the younger generations there's such we a need to vacuum. yeah mm -hmm. true so now um the one thing that i would like to ask you about really is um uh, well i think we have covered actually all of these topics here uh so tell me any of the passages uh, that made an impact on you personally the essays that you've been collecting when you say, uh, you, did you say passages? I didn't, I didn't get, you want me to read out something from the book? Um, sure, no. sure, sure, sure. No, Anything I, I, that particularly, um, um, you know, made an impact of any sort on you, you know, your, uh, what you thought of it as such? Uh, a story that I'd heard or something that, uh, you know, from the stories that you've heard right. from the people, anything that strikes your mind? Yes, actually, I something? made I I collected the stories into this book, and I I'll read you a little one, which is um, uh, quite unexpected. Actually, I call it the parting mm -hmm. present. Uh, Ali Gohar Malkani of village Malkani near Sewan had any number of Hindu friends, but none as dear as Mulo. His being Hindu had never been of consequence until partition. Is it, uh, am I audible? Can Carry on. Before Mulo and his family left Sindh for good, he came to bid Ali Gohar farewell. Ali Gohar was distraught and begged his friend not to leave, but there was nothing anyone could do. Mulo pressed Ali Gohar to use the things from his home that he could not carry. Kitchen utensils, rugs and knickknacks. There was a beautiful metal tray engraved with designs and fitted with gold handles. When special guests visited, the children would be told, Mulo varu tray khani achu, bring the Mulo tray. One of the rugs had been woven with Mulo's father's name, 
Valecha Kodumal. Ali Gohar preserved it lovingly, hoping that a day would come when he would be able to return the heirloom to his friend. Right until the war of 1965, Ali Gohar and Mulo exchanged letters. Later that year, Ali Gohar died. The letters stopped. Ali Gohar's daughter, Izzat Khatun, treasured the rug and when the time came, entrusted it to her son, Mir Hassan. Mir Hassan grew up in Sindh. He became a doctor and settled in London. His practice on Harley Street established him as London's foremost hair transplant specialist. The rug is safe with him as he continues trying to find the family of his grandfather's dearest friend so that he can return it and tell them how much the friendship meant to his family and how much they mourned its loss. So this is a story that comes out of a village of Sindh where the Hindus and Muslims, were they lived like brothers. And, uh, you know, the loss that this particular family felt uh, of a friend and the feeling of love and lo loss, which was transmitted down the generations. And Mir Hassan, who grew up in Sindh, but now lives uh, in London as one of its top doctors, he still has the rug and he brought the rug to show me. Uh, uh, and I took a photo of him and his wife with it. And I've used that photo in the book as well. And we're still looking for Mulo. <laughs> yeah. Or at least Mulo's so lovely. Uh, children, grandchildren, anyone. All we have is the name uh, Valicha Kodumal. And of course, the name of the village Malkani. Were you able to trace the family no, here? We keep I keep talking about it. We haven't found him yet, but you know, we still may. Uh, yeah, that's one of the reasons I put that. You know, people don't realize when in India, we just think of Sindhis as Sindhis. We don't realize that there are Sindhis and Sindh. And those were the those are the majority community, you know. And, uh, you know, uh, I learned that partition affected them so badly. First of all, they lost the Hindus. Uh, whom they really valued and Hindus uh, were such an essential part of Sindh. When they left, Sindh changed completely mm -hmm. and their position was taken by outsiders. Yes. So the, the right. cities of Sindh who remained, they were colonized by non-Sindhis. So they also had these identity issues. They also faced prejudice the way Hindu Sindhis face in India. You know, so it's like really, really mm -hmm. such an amazingly complex story. It's not just about trains filled with dead bodies and women being forced to jump into wells, which people see as mm -hmm. uh, the icons of partition. But the Sindhi story doesn't have these at all. It has something ent entirely different. Uh, and, you know, that part of it is the story of Mulo and the rug. Mm hmm. But of course, there uh, for all the success stories that we hear of uh, amongst the Sindhi community, there are so many, uh, you know, that still continue living in uh, the camps. You know, in and, um, yeah, Bombay, we... Mumbai, uh, in Pune itself also, then uh, many other places also. You know, they've not been able to rise out of it. That's one of the things people tell me that I haven't given enough attention to uh, the Sindhis who are not well off. Okay. Because most of my writing focuses on the Sindhis who made it, who uh, got through partition. They went through terrible times and they, um, they came out of their difficult times just by working hard and being focused and yeah, sacrificing a lot. Um, mm. Now, the, my problem is, A, I look for Sindhis who are not well off, but I don't really find them. Like, for example, once uh, I I have this friend in Sindh who keeps telling me you must learn Sindhi. I can understand Sindhi, but, you know, I didn't grow up in a Sindhi home, so I can't speak. 
And even what I understand is just pretty basic. You know, I can understand if people are talking very simple. You know, if they, if you use, I mean, there are so many words I don't understand. And, you know, I can uh, extrapolate and uh, understand, guess, using context. Mm -hmm. But so, you know, he says to me, I have such a good idea. Why don't you hire a, a Sindhi cook or a Sindhi driver? Then it'll become much easier right. for you. And I was thinking to myself, where am I going to find that? You know, I don't think they exist. You know? So I don't know. Uh, since these were not well off, I look for them, but somehow I just haven't been successful. And the second thing is that the story that I want to tell is the story of enterprise and bravery uh, and uh, of, uh, you know, a more, it's a motivational story that I'm trying to communicate. This is, of course, a story of grit, you know, the true yeah. grit, really, where, you know, they've come up against all odds, you know, where you've left your home, your homeland, you've, you know, they yeah. just had to walk away with some of them with nothing. Most some of, of them, them with you know, you, you yes. go to a strange place where people write in the opposite direction to what you're used to writing. Mm -hmm. You know, you come for a play, from a place where it never rains and you arrive in the monsoon and it's mm. pouring and pouring, you know, you know. Basically, you have to adapt mm. to a place that you're completely unfamiliar with. I, I, I think that there's, I don't think it's that easy. And people don't really want you, you know. It's a place which is, it's not a place of bounty wherever you've settled. It's um, a place where people are um, also struggling. So they don't really want you, you know, you're crowding them. But uh, you know that it wasn't just... I, that Sorry, they... uh, I remember this one, one thing my mother did tell me about, uh, you know, when she'd come to uh, Mumbai. She, in fact, uh, I think came on the same ship that you mentioned uh, your, your mother Dalburga. came on. If I'm not mistaken, it is the same right. name of the ship also. It's an, it's really uh, interesting how everybody so remembers the name of the ship they came on. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, many do, yes. not everybody, of course, but a lot of them. Were. Right. No, but she was about 16 when she had come down. And, uh, you know, the clothing that she would be wearing at that point of time was salwar, salwar kameez. Yeah. Whereas that was not what... She, you found people wearing in, uh, let's say, in Mumbai, you know, commonly as such. And that black salvar, you know, so she was immediately dubbed as, uh, you know, another community, yeah. that sort of thing there. You know, this was just during the part, the uh, independence time also, right? So uh, <laughs> that was kind of, you know, one of the strange uh, tidbits really there about, you know, sort of facing... Uh, some kind of resistance and settling through that also. Of course, uh, my mother's family had come to Mumbai before that for work, of course, uh, Bombay presidency, Sindh was a part of it. Yeah, yeah. So her brothers were working in Mumbai. And that's when she, towards the end, she came down along with my grandparents at that time. So, yeah, I mean, settling down in a new place, in a new environment completely. And starting I mean, from you know, scratch. A big story coming from my paternal family also there. So all of that, right. So tell me, uh, where can people find your book? It's on Amazon. Uh, I, or, you know, you can email me if you want a copy. Uh, just send me an email. Uh, sars at ccomindia.com it's if you google my name and you know google has my mail id it's quite easy mm -hmm. uh, but so it's on okay. amazon kitab khana in bombay has it uh Barisans in delhi has it uh, gangarams and atagalata in bangalore have it so the main bookshops in these cities Great. have got it Wonderful, wonderful. I'll mention more details in the description below the video as well then. Thank, thank you so you. much, Saz. Thank you so I'm much. Well. 
wish you fantastic uh, success with this new book also. And uh, uh, let's meet up soon. Thank <laughs> you. I hope you did enjoy this conversation. A lot to take away from here. And I think there is a lot to be continued here as well on this discussion. Thank you again for joining us today. And do let us know if you did enjoy this. Namaste. Please click on the like button on YouTube and wherever else you are watching us from to help others find this video as well. Also, subscribe to the channel to help us bring you more such content. IHA now accepts content contributions. And if you would like to support our work with paid promotions or sponsorships, please email us for further information.